Hi, Grace Light family. My name is Faith. And this is Mike. We live with our three children, David, Ariella, and Jutha, in the Middle East. Yeah, and our calling connected with Grace Life is to raise up national leaders that will make disciples and make Jesus famous here in this region. And we just thank you so much for your prayers, your financial support, and just walking with us on this journey of reaching our world. Well, I'd love to share a story about what God is doing over here. I had the privilege uh, over the few years to work with um, a man named Muhammad, who has really, you know, one, entered the kingdom of God and been following Jesus Christ and, and worshiping Jesus Christ. And two, has, has really become a leader um, where he's now uh, leading and facilitating a group of other national believers um, that are engaging in God's word and, and worshiping Jesus and learning more about who God is. Um, one of the cool things that God's really doing is is, is raising up Muhammad um, as that leader. And um, we now have uh, God's really established four generations of disciples. So me investing into Muhammad. Um, but now one of the one of the men in that group um, is is really rising up as a leader. And that man is now investing into uh, a, one of his friends. And he's meeting with that friend independently. And they're going through kind of the same process of helping that person become a disciple of Jesus. That person is now believing, and they've gone through that over a period of time. And now that person is being equipped and encouraged to go and share with their family and friends. So it's been a really cool journey um, of now seeing a fourth generation disciple and also to see uh, national leaders that are that are raised up um, and really God's building um, his community. Building. And so as uh, we are talking about being in a uh, global outreach series, if you're here for the first time today, this is part two of a short little three-part series we're doing. Started last week. That means we're going to end next week. If you missed part one, don't worry. It's online as well as on our website. You can go and on our app and catch it there. Uh, but we're doing this uh, short little series themed about Jonah and uh, how we still have a mission on planet Earth. You know, sometimes it's easy to lose sight. We think that we're here to be really good Christians. You're not. The truth is you'll be the best Christian ever when you die and go to heaven. You think we're here to worship God. We're not. You'll worship God better than ever in heaven with angels by your side and a glorified mind. You won't be distracted by the lights or anything else. It'll be great. We're not here for that. It's good that we do those things while we're here, but we're here to reach our world. That is the reason that we're still on planet Earth. And so uh, we like to, every year, make sure we take a time and, and talk about this. And so this is part two of our Global Outreach series. The room is actually more crowded today than it was last week. And so I, I want to say something to you. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but I mean it with all sincerity. You see, when we do a series talking about how some of your friends are not going to heaven, about how there are people that you go to class with that are not going to heaven, because heaven is real, hell is real. You live next door to people that are not going to heaven. That is not always the easiest topic to hear about, right? It, it can be a series that, that really gets us out of our comfort zone, and so when you come and you get caught off guard, it's part one, you can be like, oh, there's two more weeks, honey, let's skip that. Because what happens is we, we begin to feel like, well, oh, I've got a friend that might be going to hell. Now I've got to go have this uncomfortable conversation with them, you know, because I don't want to feel guilty, you know, so I got to go talk to them. And the pastor put me up to it and he made me feel really bad, you know, that kind of thing. And you came back. And so, look, first of all, I want to tell you, I understand how uncomfortable this whole topic can be. I think the devil wants it to be more uncomfortable than it really is, just to be honest. So, like, I, I can talk about Jesus pretty easily because I'm a pastor. Just as soon as I, I'm a pastor, people immediately expect me to have an uncomfortable conversation with them. <laughs> I mean, true story, one time on an airplane talking to the person beside me, she's like, well, where are you from and what do you do? And as soon as I said I'm a pastor, I, like, one second, she pulls out her headphones and goes, Dip, conversation <laughs> over. Okay. 
Got that. But wait, look, before I was a pastor, actually, I, I understood how hard it was to do this. I was a, a school teacher, and our church was doing something really special where we wanted to invite everybody, and especially people who didn't have a church, didn't know God. It was like, this is going to be a great opportunity. We're designing this series or this event. I forget exactly what it was specifically to help reach people who aren't going to church. So go and invite someone. It was a really big push. Everybody go and invite someone. Here's the invite. Here's what you do. And uh, I actually had what I would call an easy layup for this because people at school knew that uh, I was a volunteer youth pastor. They knew that I liked God. People would even talk to me and have questions about God and some things sometimes. And so there was this one teacher in particular that you could just tell God was working in their life. They were, they were having really great conversations, really great questions. And so when it came time for inviting someone, man, I had like the, the ball is just like right there. All you got to do is boop and it goes in, you know. And as crazy as that should have been so easy, in my mind, it was just really, really hard. And it was such an awkward moment of thinking that I'm going to walk up to a human being and say, hey, would you come to church with me? And plus, as two teachers, you never know when the annoying kid is going to hang around and want to ask a question that is totally irrelevant because you answered it three times in class anyway. But that, that's just my teacher wound. And so... What I did is I took the invitation after day after day. I kept, oh, man, I got to do this. And when it came the last day, like Friday of the week, I took the invitation to the mailroom. <laughs> and I put it in their mailbox, and I went back to my desk at my classroom, and I emailed them, hey, put something in the box for you. <laughs> they didn't come to church. So, look, here's the thing. I understand how uncomfortable the topic can be to you. Uh, and then I realized how the devil would love to jump on that. He, he, he takes any opportunity he can. And then we start to feel condemned. Well, you know, that person is because of you. You didn't pray for them enough. You didn't talk to them enough. So I, I want to hopefully just give everybody a little bit of grace today as, as we're talking about this. I do mean it. Thank you by saying you came back for something that you knew was very challenging to you personally. And uh, what we're trying to learn from Jonah is that he also didn't find it very easy to go. And yet God was merciful to him, and God gave him another chance, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I hope that you leave not feeling condemned and not feeling guilty, but encouraged and a lot of hope that God has something for you, as well as your friends and your neighbors. So we're going to jump into the story of Jonah where we left off last week. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to be in the last sentence of chapter 1, but don't worry, it'll also be on the screen right here. Because uh, maybe somebody wasn't here for part 1, or it's just good, I'm going to catch us up, review where we are in the story. And so last week, here's what happened. God came to a man named Jonah, and he says, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh because it's, it's kind of a bad place. Their evil has risen up before me. I want you to go and tell them about a different way of life that honors me. And Jonah's like, you are right to say their evil has risen up before you because they're the most horrible people on the earth. There's no way I'm going there. So Jonah actually runs the opposite direction. He buys a ticket on a boat headed across the Mediterranean Sea to the furthest known point in his world at the time. But he didn't get very far because he was running from God. So God sends this big storm upon the sea and uh, it endangers the ship and all of the sailors, none of which worshiped God. They were all from uh, other places and other religions. Jonah was the only God-fearing person on the boat. And, and so they're all fearing for their lives. Everybody is praying to their God. They even roll dice. Like what could be happening? And the dice point to Jonah. So they all go, what's up with you, man? What's the problem? What did you do? And he says, well, it turns out I'm the one here who happens to know the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. And, uh, well, he told me to do something, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> so uh, this is why all this has come upon you. Sorry to get you in trouble. So they say, well, well how can you get us out of trouble? Because we really don't like this. And uh, they, he said, it would just throw me overboard. And as a last resort, ultimately, they did throw him overboard. That's where we're going to pick up the story today. Poor little Jonah is now flailing about in the midst of a sea in a huge raging storm that was dangerous for a boat, much less a dude who apparently was not a marathon swimmer. And so we pick up the story at this point where it says, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, how many people at this point say, Just stop it. Like, isn't this one of the most unbelievable sentences in all the Bible, right? Come on, somebody with me? This is one of the most unbelievable verses in the whole of Scripture. And so there are some of you that just want to shout and whatever you have to to get me off stage because you're like, well, the truth is, Jimmy, I was giving you a little leeway. When you brought up the whole Jonah thing, 
I was going to try to, you know, learn a life lesson from this guy because we all know the story is utterly ridiculous, right? And so, look, we just have to go ahead and talk about this for a minute. Is this story utterly ridiculous or not? And so, I'll just be honest with you, a lot of people actually believe that the story of Jonah and the great fish, these four chapters in the Bible, are really just allegory. They're just meant for us to learn from like a fable or a parable. There's a life lesson that we can see in it. And well, Jesus came and he, he taught a lot of parables, right? Everybody knows that. And his parables had great points. And so we had lots that we can learn from those and, and apply to our lives. So for the record, if you decide here today that the story of Jonah is allegory, it still has its place in Scripture and is still a very valuable story for you, okay? You guys with me on this one? But what if it's more than allegory? What if it's actually history? What if it's more than just a fable or a fiction and it's actually fact. What is it? Because the truth is, when something is a true story, we do tend to take it a little more seriously, don't we? And so what I want to do is just answer a couple of questions, maybe give you some things to consider as you decide, is Jonah just allegory, or could we actually believe this as being a real event with a real person. And so here, here we go. I'm going to give you just a couple of things to thought, think about. And the first one is that Jonah was a real person. And I can prove that one to you. Jonah was a real person. We're going to leave the book of Jonah, and we're going to go to the historical records of the accounts of the kings, the chronicling of the kings in the Old Testament. So here we are in the book of 2 Kings. It says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. We've got two different nations, and we've got both of their lineages listed. He became king of Israel. He began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. That's a lot of detailed historical information. And it says that he, Jeroboam, restored the border of Israel from Blebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord. He did what God had said he would do, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer? Again, a lot of detailed information, even the city where he is coming from. I don't know if you remember last week, but how did the entire story of Jonah begin? It said this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai. And so what we have in the books of, of Chronicles and Kings in the Old Testament, we have the, the listing of the accounts of kings, and they always say, well, this one began to reign at this date compared to the king of that nation at that date, and, and was invaded by the king of that nation like Assyria or Babylon or something else. Here's the point. Uh, what we see in the historical records there can be supported by extra-biblical accounts, meaning it's not just the Bible that says these people were real. And there is no reason to ever believe that anyone listed in these historical chronicles were allegorical or not a real person. So at the very beginning, what we can go ahead and say is at least Jonah was a real dude who lived upon the earth at a real point in time, right? So we just need to answer the question, could this real dude have actually had such a tall tale? Well, let's move on to the second idea, and that is this word fish, because he was swallowed by a great fish, right? And the problem we have is we, of course, speak English, so we're reading it with the context of English. And for us, fish comes to mind the first thing that we think of are the little guppies in our children's fish tank. Or the betta fish everybody seems to buy thinking it's the easiest pet in the world. Don't get them. We just got one. They die. They don't live very long. Then you have sad children, just for the record. <laughs> I currently have a sad daughter and an empty fish tank at home, but, or we think of the fish of the day when we're ordering halibut at a restaurant. That's what comes to mind for us, and so we're thinking, how could anything in the guppy family possibly do what we see here in this story? Well, again, our problem is English, because the Hebrew word for fish here actually has a much wider meaning, and one of the things that it means is great aquatic beast. I just love that. Great aquatic beast. And so as we think about whether or not this great aquatic beast could do this very thing and, and this could be a true story, we also need to add into this idea that this great aquatic beast in this story a few thousand years ago could be extinct by now. That's a possibility, right? But I'll offer you one better possibility. You may not be aware of this, but over 85% of our oceans are unexplored and unobserved. We have no idea what is out there for the most part. 
And a lot of it because it's too deep. We simply can't go there. And so if 85% of our oceans being the most unexplored part of our natural world at the time, we have no clue what's there, then how can we be so sure there is not such a great aquatic beast that could have taken place in this story? And so with that being said, let's, let's move on to our third piece of evidence. And I, I love this because every time that I'm preaching on something, God sends me extra little things. And so I was reading the headlines this past week. It turns out I found an article from NPR that talked about what scientists have discovered anew, discovered new, about whales. Now, by the way, a lot of people always refer to this as Jonah and the well. Just to be clear, nowhere in the Bible does it say that this was a well. But for the fun of it, let's just go with it, okay, for a second. And what they discovered about wells is they eat two to three times as much as they ever thought before. I love articles that say scientists previously thought. And look, I am not, not criticizing science at all. I love science. I've got a scientific mind. I've got good friends who are scientists. I love that we can learn and study about our natural world. But what we do have to be reminded is that science is a still learning field. We're still discovering things about our natural world, like the 85% of the oceans we don't know anything about and the, the ends of the universe. There's so much that we don't know. And so what concerns me is when somebody says, I could never believe in your God because the story of Jonah and the well is ridiculous. Couldn't have happened scientifically. It's like, wait a minute. I'm not sure that you want to risk your entire eternal future based upon current understanding of 15% of the seas. But anyway, with that being said, what they did discover about these wells is that they actually eat 10 to 20 tons of food per day. Per day. They never thought that that was possible. And in the article, to give you a concept, they said that that's equal to 80,000 Big Macs a day. I don't know why they went there with Big Macs, but for those of you that love to go to McDonald's, just remember that when they thought about tons, the first thing that came to mind was McDonald's food. I'll just leave that out there for you. So it turns out that swallowing a human, even for a well, much less an unknown great aquatic beast, isn't difficult. It's not even the unbelievable part of the story. So here we go. Here's where we are in the story. We have a very real person who uh, is seen throughout history outside of this one story. We have the understanding that the word fish is, is varied and could mean something really large and really great. And, and there's a lot of chance we don't know what's out there, right? And it turns out that swallowing a human would not have been difficult. So... At this point in the story, if you're asking, can we believe this to be a true story, the only miracle that's necessary, the only thing that the God of heaven has to do is restrict the digestion of a fish. That's it. And what amazes me is I talk to people, especially like people who are, I'm not really sure, I'm a believer, I don't know, there's a lot of questions in the Bible. But they come to church about twice a year, it's a very common thing, Christmas and Easter. They come on Christmas and Easter. So they, they say, I'm not really sure we can believe all this, but I will come once a year to celebrate someone being born of a virgin. <laughs> and I'll come back to celebrate how a dead man walked out of a tomb. And I'm really intrigued by the story of Peter walking on the water. That's pretty cool. But restricting the digestion of a fish, now that's just going too far. Don't know about that. <laughs> and by the way, I, again, since I, the NPR article came across this week, uh, do I have any Mandalorian fans in the room? Any, anybody out there? Cool, there you go. How many of you are excited? Third season's getting ready to come out. All right, so uh, my family loves Mandalorian, all but one of our children. And so what we've been doing these past couple of weeks is we've been re-watching season one and season two to get ready for season three. And, and I just think the timing is so divine that last night we sat down to watch this episode in season two. Does anybody remember the crate dragon? Okay, it's essentially a great aquatic beast that lives in sand. It's a massive beast that comes up out of the ground and it can swallow this elephant-sized thing whole and it also happens to swallow the Mandalorian whole. But then it goes back into the ground, and from nowhere the beast comes out of the ground because the Mandalorian from in the belly electroshocked it, and it spit out the Mandalorian, and then we all cheer, yes! But that could have never happened in the Bible. <laughs> and my favorite one, my last piece of evidence for you to consider is Jesus said it was history. In Matthew 12, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you because we think you're full of it. 
But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, the real person. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be. Just as Jonah was, so the Son of Man will be. He didn't say just as the story about Jonah goes. He didn't say just as the fable tells it. <clears throat> he said just as Jonah, the real human, was, so I will be. As he foreshadows what is getting ready to come to him for being in the grave and then being raised from the dead. Now, at this point, some people would say, well, the problem, Jimmy, <clears throat> if we're going to take that for history, is Jesus wasn't in the grave three days and three nights. We know for a fact he died on Friday and he was risen on Sunday. So that's only two nights. Therefore, Scripture again is inaccurate. So all of your points are now invalid. I would say we have to go back to being Hebrew again. Because what we have to remember, just like the word fish, we can't put our life on what Scripture says. So here's the thing. Jesus was a Hebrew. Jonah was a Hebrew. So if they're going to tell us their story, before we discount it, we have to understand how they would tell their story. And it turns out that Hebrews count time very, very differently from you and me. So they use a phrase, day and night, to simply represent a 24-hour period, day. But they would go around and say, well, three days and three nights. And what they really meant was three days. And it's just like you and me. We, we do the same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we, we might be uh, at a deadline, one minute till midnight when we're in college. Some of you remember this. And you're clicking send. Some of us, we go back further. And we actually had to run the paper across campus and shove it under the door of the professor's office one minute till midnight because the paper was due at midnight. And the professor opens the door because you're the last one there just trying to make the deadline. And you say, oh, whew, I'm so glad I made it. I've worked day and night for the entire week. <laughs> and we would believe him because we understand day and night actually means you worked a lot. You worked more than an eight-hour day with lunch in the middle. It means that you probably got up early. You might have stayed up late. You might have even worked for 16 hours in the library most days. But no one thinks that that means that you worked writing for 24 hours times seven with no breaks for the bathroom or dinner or anything. No one believes that, and yet we still believe you're telling the truth. And so when Hebrews would say three days and three nights, they simply meant three days, three 24-hour time periods, but they took it one step further. Because Hebrews didn't count all 24 hours to count a day. It only had to be part. So in other words, you didn't have to be in the belly 72 hours, nor did Jesus have to be in the grave 72 hours. They only had to be their part of some of those days. And so a Hebrew would say, hey, a three days journey. What they would mean is you could start at lunchtime on day one, and you could get there before lunch on day three. It's still a three days journey. It didn't have to be 24 times three. So according to the way Jesus counted and spoke, and according to the way Jonah counted and spoke and would have written, it is very easy for them to say for three days and three nights. But Jesus goes on to verify more of it. He says the men of Nineveh, the people that Jonah was going to go to, and he does, we'll get there next week. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. <clears throat> Why would they do that in the future? Because of what they did in the past. For they repented, <clears throat> excuse me, at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So as far as Jesus is concerned, something happened in the past that's history. And that is that Jonah went to Nineveh. That Jonah preached in Nineveh. That the people in Nineveh actually responded and repented. Which means what we're going to read about next week is also true according to Jesus. And so as a result of that, the, the people of Nineveh are going to stand up and go, Why didn't you believe Jesus? We believe Jonah. You had something better than Jonah. You had Jesus. And so what Jesus is talking about is this, this great sign. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah that's about to come to this generation? Well, there are lots of meanings, and I'm just going to hit on three of them. But the first one, the most obvious, is that Jesus is going to die on the cross to pay for our sins. He's going to spend three days in the grave. Again, not, 370, not 72 hours, not three time periods of 24, but parts of three days. He's going to be raised from the dead, and there will be forgiveness of sin, eternal life for anyone who calls upon his name. That's one of the signs of Jonah. The second sign of Jonah is the, the idea of God being merciful. Here is Jonah disobeying God. And let's keep in mind, he was disobeying God intentionally, not accidentally or not just out of a little bit of ignorance or a little bit of misunderstanding of Scripture. Jonah knew he was supposed to go to Nineveh. 
There was never a question that God said that to him. And he intentionally went the other way. And yet, as he was being thrown into the sea, God comes and saves him. Even as he is disobeying God, God is being merciful. One of the, the, the great meanings of the sign of Jonah is the continued mercy of God being displayed towards people who do not deserve it. Which brings us to the third one we'll talk about, and that is God's mercy to the lost. God still wants to take his message to Nineveh. And, and so here's what we need to understand is that in our world today, in this generation, the sign of Jonah is still being shown all around us, and that's where you and I come in. We become Jonah in the story of taking the sign of Jonah to our generation. So let's pick it up. Where is Jonah? Jonah is uh, swallowed by a fish, either in your allegory or in your true story, whichever one you decided. Um, but I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to say that it was really happening. So here's Jonah in the middle of the fish. <clears throat> and he says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, you heard my voice. <clears throat> For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And I just want to stop and point out the obvious here. The sailors threw him overboard, but Jonah's given all acknowledgement that God's in charge of that. You did it. I ran from you. You did it. Let's not talk about the sailors anymore. Let's just talk about what you want from me. And so he goes on and says, when my life was fainting away, drowning in the sea, he says, I remember the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. I want you all to notice what he says in these three verses, because if you were here for part one, we discovered Jonah's incredibly arrogant. And he thinks he's the only one good enough. He and his people are good enough for God to be merciful, but nobody else deserves that. So check out what he just said. Well, as I was drowning, I remembered to pray. I remembered to call out. Look at that, God. I was once again one of your good people. And his next verse is one of those who pay regard to vain idols. Those who worship other things, well, then they forsake their hope of your love. For all I know, God, that boat finally is upside down and all those pagan sailors are drowning and they deserve it because they're not like me. He literally keeps going and says, but I, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. But does it, Jonah? Really? I wish I could do that better. We've got a young lady on our staff. She's got this really great way of going, but did you really? I should have had her just stand here for that moment. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Does it really? Because you seem to think that it belongs to you and other really good people. And, and that people who need God's mercy the most, no, actually, salvation doesn't belong to God. God doesn't get to decide if it goes to the Ninevites. God doesn't get to decide if it goes to the sailors. No, Jonah, apparently it just belongs to you and all of the good people. And the reason we have to actually stop and realize what Jonah is doing is because we still do it today. We sing, salvation belongs to the Lord, but really we just mean us, the good ones who gather together and lift up our hands and carry our Bibles. And when God tells you to go to those people, you're like, oh, excuse me? Do you know what they say about you, God? We're not even talking about me. But by the way, you know what they put on Facebook about me? I mean, seriously, you want me to go? No. Oh, but salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, that's the question, and that's why we're doing the series. Do you believe salvation belongs to the Lord and he has the right to extend mercy to anyone? And that the people he's already extended it to, you and me, we become part of the process of extending his mercy to others around us. The truth is salvation does belong to the Lord. It wasn't because Jonah deserved it that he ever got it. It was because of God's mercy. It wasn't because... Jonah was the greatest Israelite or the greatest prophet. It was because of God's mercy. It's not because you and I are really good Christians and show up every week and go to all three services. No, it's because of God's mercy. And so, there's a couple of questions we should reflect on as we look in the mirror at this point and try to learn something from Jonah. The first one is, do you ever see yourself in Jonah? I mean, you stop and think for a minute. Do you ever see yourself in Jonah? Like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I would do that. <clears throat> yeah, I have done that. And I know somebody would like to push back a little bit right now and go, well, I've never been called to Nineveh. 
Maybe not. But chances are pretty good every one of us has something God's told us to do that we haven't gone running the same direction as we should have. So we've all got a little something where we can see Jonah in our story, but the truth is, I think we actually all have a Nineveh. We all have people that we just kind of write off and think they get what's coming to them. They deserve what's coming to them. If you recall from part one, the Ninevites were really bad people. Bad people. They did evil things, especially to the people they conquered. They had been at war with Jonah's people in the past. Jonah had a lot of good reason to remember the history between his people and those people. And he had every reason in his human fallen heart to say they get what's coming to them. And as you ask yourself, do I see myself in Jonah? Is there someone that you think deserves what's coming to them? Is it maybe a, a person? Is it maybe a group of people? I think we've all got someone, and that would lead me to the other question, last question that I think we, we have to answer. Ask God to give you a name. Ask God to give you a name. It would be the greatest shame for us to spend three weeks talking about the mission and why we're on planet Earth. And then when it's over, we're like, well, that's, that was good. Appreciate that, Jimmy. All right, back, back to life. Back to going to work with people who are going to hell. Not worried about them. Back to going to school with people who are not going to heaven. Eh, not worried about them. Let's ask God for a name. God, who in my science class do I need to talk to? God, which one of my neighbors do I need to invite over for coffee? And, and go ahead and just be prepared. He's going to tell you the weirdest one on the street. He is. You're going to be like, seriously, God? Like, I bet I've got nothing to talk to that person about. I don't even like waving to them. They, oh my goodness, seriously, God? Yes. Because that's how Jonah felt about the Ninevites. Ask God for a name. Pray for him. Go to them. We'll talk more about that next week. But you know, the truth is you can remove some of the awkward, right? I told you I didn't want to, oh no, uncomfortable conversation. You don't always have to start with an uncomfortable conversation. Truth is it usually doesn't work well when you start out with, hey, my name is Bob. I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> it's usually not going to bear the most fruit. There are lots of other things you can do, like inviting your neighbor to coffee, just being kind to the kid in your class that no one else is kind to, treating them like a human when no one else does, like just acknowledging that coworker with a good morning and a smile, and then maybe you include them in the lunch club that goes out every day, or just start by being a kind human, because the opportunity for conversation is going to come. It's going to come quickly. We live in a hurting world. Somebody's going to say something. They're going to ask something. The opportunity is going to come. So let's wrap up the story today because uh, we don't want to leave poor Jonah in the belly of a fish for a whole week. He's already been there three days. We, we need to move on and get him out. So I'm going to close with an encouraging thought for you. Chapter 2 ends. It says, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. <laughs> we seriously discussed calling the series Fish Puke, um, <laughs> but wisdom prevailed. Okay, that's not the encouraging thought, but that sets the stage for the encouraging thought because now that Jonah's on dry land, here's your encouraging thought. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Don't y'all love second chances? God said to him, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. And so, Jonah arose and went. We'll pick up what happens in Nineveh next week, but we're going to close today by just being reminded we worship a God who gives second chances. Third, fourth, fifth. If there's something in here that you've been running from, Today's your second chance. If there's someone 
you've been avoiding, today's your second chance. Our God is a God of mercy. I want you to remember, Jonah on purpose ran the opposite direction. God threw him in a sea and then God saved him. I, I mean, I could just kind of imagine how the story goes at this point, you know, fish puke whoosh, whoosh, on, on the sea and God looks, God's laughing at him like, seriously, man, did you think that was going to work? I mean, you know, I'm the God of heaven, the God of earth. That, look, you've gone and turned this into the most ridiculous story. It would have been cool in the Bible. Now people are going to struggle with the Bible their whole lives. Like you got swallowed by a fish, you got spit out. Nobody's going to believe it, but you and me. Oh, by the way, a little bit of fish puke right there. If you could wipe that off. Nineveh, get going. Still love you, buddy. God's looking at you right now saying, just wipe it off. Still love you. Let's get going. And whatever the second chance is in your life, here's the really cool result of it. Your second chance to go to that person in your class or your coworker or your neighbor, it's their second chance to turn to God. It means they're, they're going to get another opportunity to say, yes, God, thank you. And maybe this is the one chance they need. We all probably took more than one, more than two. We probably all remember the times that we told somebody, stop inviting me to church, stop it. <laughs> but then something happened that one time. Maybe this is that one time for them truth is it doesn't matter what you've run from or what you've refused to do in the past the only thing that matters is what you start doing tomorrow because your Nineveh is still waiting all around you let me pray for us God we thank you that you are so merciful and, and every part of our lives we see it we are here today because you've given us another day to wake up knowing that days before were not perfect. They might not have glorified you as they should, and yet every day you give us another chance to say, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Help me to honor you today. God, you give us another chance to talk to that neighbor. You give us another chance to do the thing you've told us to do. God, we thank you today for so many second chances. And God, today I pray that you would cause us to be people who respond now. Right now, today, we say, okay, God, now I will go. Thank you for the second chance. If you're just staying in a place of prayer, I want to speak to those of you that maybe today is your second chance to make Jesus your king. The truth is Jesus came as the son of God upon the earth. Because he was God, he was able to live a perfect, sinless life so that when he was crucified, his life could pay for your sins. And then he was raised from the dead by the supernatural power of the Father. And so he offers you eternal life as well. If you've never made the exchange, though, of the life that you've been living on earth for the one that he has for you in all of eternity that begins today, I want to help you do that wherever you are. Simply say something like this to yourself and to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now... I choose to live for you. I thank you that you love me. And I thank you that I'm forgiven. In my prayer here today, would you fill me with your spirit and give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom. Amen. Everybody help me celebrate with those people. Amen.